admit we had lots of te technical errors yesterday so we've done lots of practice late into the night and hopefully we won't have so many i'm not going to say we won't have any because i'm not sure that's entirely possible but we'll do our very best if you'd like to leave more detailed feedback on any session, we have the facility to do that and we'd really appreciate it. So if you have particular thoughts about a session that you'd like to leave, we'd love to see those. I'm gonna ask Tarek now if he can just put into the chat a link to an address where you can go and leave detailed feedback about any particular session we've covered during these two weeks. So there's a really good opportunity to do that too. Now, one of the things that was brilliant yesterday and a lot of people liked was our dramatic entrance from our working groups, but we were all very sad that we didn't get to see Jorn's fantastic blockbuster video. So I would like to try to just take two minutes now and I'm risking tempting fate with the technical hitches again, but I'm gonna ask Juan if you can take over the screen share and show us Jorn's video. There you go. Wasn't that worth seeing? I'm glad we did that. Great work, Jorn. And a lot of hours, I think, spent late at night in front of the computer editing. So now mm -hmm. you all know, if any of you want a video edited or if you want a trailer for a big movie you're thinking of bringing out, he's your man. There he is. Just message him. Give him a call, email, Skype, whatever. He'll be there for you. Production team at the ready. Uh, well, not totally, but I hope you're really motivated to go to the area-based approaches uh, session. Absolutely. We will expect to see you all there, 100%. So what we wanted to do with this first 10 minutes or so of each session was I need to always share a little bit about housekeeping things, as I've done. But I also wanted to take an opportunity just to reflect a little bit on the day before. So... I'm gonna in a moment invite Juan and Dare to join me, um, but I also wanted to ask you. So I was thinking about having to do this whole workshop virtually and how it's a bit sad that we can't be in the same room. But then I thought about it a bit differently and I thought, actually, we're not in any room. You're in my house. This is my kitchen. There's my kettle. That's my window. This is me. And this is my coffee. So I thought, why don't we do it this way? So come on in, sit down, bring a coffee, join me in my kitchen, and let's have a little chat about what happened yesterday. So cheers, everybody. <laughs> That's great. Okay, so what I want to do is two things. Firstly, I'm going to ask all of you for your views on uh, yesterday and your views generally on um, CCCM at the moment. So sit down with me, have a coffee and tell us how strong do you think CCCM is in 2020? This is a Mentimeter, so if you saw it yesterday you go to menti.com on your phone, you add in that code and you put in some ideas. But whilst you're doing that I would like to ask Juan and Dare if you are there to unmute your mics, bring your coffee, sit down with me and say hello. Hopefully they're here. I can see one, but I can't hear you. Sorry, I'm here. And I, I do have, I have my tea. Good, good, well At done. Work. 
And there is, are you around? Do we have there with a cup of coffee anywhere? If not, you're going to get all the difficult questions on your own one. No, we'll save the difficult questions for Der at the okay. end. Okay, let's do all the easy ones to you then. So, Juan, tell me, how did you think yesterday went? I think it went great. I mean, we had a lot of, I guess, as to be expected, we had a lot of technical glitches. Um, but I think that came from our intention to, you know, knowing that it's going to be a presentation heavy day. We want to try and make it at least as enjoyable for people joining in as much as possible. Um, so we went to make a lot of videos in order to allow different people to, I guess, hear about what we've been doing and what different country clusters um, and the working groups have been doing in the, as enjoyable ways as possible. Um, yeah. And I was, I'm so, and I think the energy in, you know, the room or my room was like amazing. And I think everyone was really patient with us and, and kind in, in your comments yesterday. <laughs> they were indeed. And, and yesterday we focused on where, where CCCM has come and where the cluster system has come over 15 years and where you land today, right? So as a cluster today in 2020, we had a look at what's been achieved. And that's why I guess I've put this slightly controversial question on the screen. And I'd like your view on that too, Juan. You know, as cluster coordinator for CCCM, how are you feeling about CCCM in 2020? I think maybe um, I need to sort of like refer back to the video we did about 15 years of CCCM cluster. Um, for me, who's, you know, compared to many of the people talking yesterday, I'm relatively new to the sector. Um, so it's really great to see, you know, where we came from. I see a lot of connections that we've built on the previous um, sort of practitioners. I think um, we've come much stronger in terms of making more people aware of what we do. Um, I think it's great to see conversation about capacity development, engagement with uh, national and local authorities, you know, that continue throughout. And I think the fact that we ended yesterday with, uh, with Raphael also telling us how much life is easy, easier for CCCM when we've done the preparedness, when we've done the capacity development together with the governments. And, and I think this leads so well into today's conversation um, because I think it's that relationship that we make with, um, with people in the country, with people who work as national, local frontline workers. Um, you know, and I mean, CCCM is a sector that is strange and that is all about the people. And, and I think the fact that we're, able to get so many people together here yesterday and today and so many people to come and join us and present and share their stories today i i definitely feel like we're, we're on the right way on the right path you know i see some question around like how do you define stronger and and <laughs> I and i guess it's strong yeah. like black coffee that's that's how you design define strong it's like a strong <laughs> black coffee Okay, so, and, and I can tell you now, we, we've got 108 participants online now. So, so folk who perhaps arrive a couple of minutes late, but they've arrived in numbers, which is fantastic. So great to see you. If you've just arrived late, just a quick reminder that you're gonna need the latest version of Zoom for today's session. So if you have Zoom downloaded on your computer, please go and check updates. Otherwise you're not gonna be able to join the session um, or at least join the breakout group you want to. So Juan, I'm not going to let you get off that easily, unless we can find Dare. Dare, <laughs> come to the surface for a really difficult question. Or oh, keep just, laughing, it's up to you. I was just muting myself in uh, anticipation. In hope that you could get away with it. No, <laughs> I'm not going to let you get away with it. So, so there is more to do, right? And I know this because I've been involved with working with you guys around strategy, and we're going to have a session next week on strategy. But there's a lot of really interesting sessions between now and next week. So how do we use these sessions that are coming up to, to strengthen the cluster and to strengthen CCCM? So, so today's localization, and there's a really exciting session coming up, and you mentioned how important that is. What are you hoping we can, we can do and, and, and to, to make this stronger, take it forward? 
Yeah, that is a tough that's, question, isn't it? That's not such a straightforward um, question. Um, we definitely have a lot of work to do, I think, to spread the word about uh, what we do in CCCM. And another really important session coming up is around the development of minimum standards in camp management. Um, I think it's been our one big effort that we spent over the past three years working on. I think in, I mean, in order for us to be able to work in a more, you know, systematic, consistent and measurable manner, but it also is a tool for us to communicate with other people, with other sectors, with donors, with um, national, local authorities. Um, and I think the work should not just fall on, on us, the global cluster. I think CCCM is definitely like a collective. And I think everyone counts in making sure that, you know, like what we do in CCCM is extremely valid. I think we work to ensure you know, the, the protection of the rights uh, of the displaced population. We work to make sure that they're able to feel represented and participate um, in the camp life cycle, but also decision-making process um, in what is to come for, for their, dis, you know, situation. So what, I feel like, oops, sorry. No, I was going to say one of the things that's come out of the strategy discussion so far that's really interesting is the change in role for uh, local actors, particularly local authorities, and I guess that feeds into this too. Absolutely. Yeah. Sorry, my cat is sneezing in the background. I you need to stop feeding it pepper. Okay, listen, Juan, thank you so much. Really <laughs> appreciate that. And you managed that all on your own, that interview. Shall we give her the job? Give me a thumbs up if you think we should give Juan the job. <laughs> Yeah, I think she did pretty well. Okay, we'll give it to you, Juan. Well done. Blair doesn't get the job because he didn't turn up to the interview. So uh, <laughs> so that's no good for him. But I'm sure we'll catch him later. Maybe we'll get an interview with him a little bit later on. Um, and thank you, everyone, who's putting these fabulous comments in. Hopefully you mm -hmm. can see them scrolling up your screen. which gives you a chance to, to feed in. And hopefully you're seeing some and responding to others. But what I'd like to do now is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop this share because I am going to hand over to our facilitator for today or our main facilitator for today. And I've been practicing with surnames, right? So, oof. okay, so, so all Norwegians, Jorn, you're going you're gonna to cringe at this, but I'm, I'm going to say it's Jennifer Kvenmo, um, I think. Apparently all the vowels need to come out of my nose. Jorn, can you tell us properly what it is? Okay, we would have to rename Jennifer to Jennifer Tvarmo. Okay, there you go. That's good. And then Cynthia of the incredible surname. So I was going to go for Birikundavi. Is that close? Not too bad, but I know the Burundians that have logged in or maybe cringing a little bit but yeah. it's okay we forgive you <laughs> thank you they're probably actually dying of pain with my pronunciation so i'll set you all the challenge you can try and pronounce my surname by the end of the uh end of the week but with that thanks everyone and jen and cynthia it's over to you thanks charlie um and yorn for the pronunciation that was that was good um we we um one I'm just going to ask you if you can look at the Spanish channel because we're supposed to be having a Spanish channel and I'm getting a message that maybe it's um, not exactly working, but that's a kind of side task. This is going to be a little bit different than yesterday. Um, I feel like with yesterday, it was a lot of presentations and a lot of um, kind of top level ideas around the CCCM cluster, and although we entered into the topic of localization, today I feel like this is more discussion among friends, and I hope that this can be a little bit more relaxed. Yesterday felt a little bit high pressure, and today's going to be more of a discussion. Um, we have a lot of people joining us kind of on all sides of the time zones. So we have people who are um, should be in bed by now in Indonesia and Australia. And we have people who should be in bed in America um, and in Latin America. So we have all sides of the spectrum of time zones. 
So I just want to acknowledge that this should be more of a discussion, more of a conversation, and that we really hope that we can get um, kind of a better understanding around the topic of localization as we mean it as CCCM, CCCMers. I don't know if that's a, a term or not, but I feel like there's been lots of terminology about CCCM and that how do we rationalize it back to us. So that's the objective of today is to look to some smart people to talk among ourselves and to really rationalize the topic back to ourselves at home. So I'm really um, delighted to have this discussion together with you and I'm going to share the screen because I'm going to drive our the beginning part of our conversation with a presentation um, and give us something to link onto visually. Are you seeing my screen? Good. Let me put it in presentation mode. So some of the highlights of today is that we're going to do um, some, some fun, cool, online-y things. And we're going to be taking a poll, oh, which I think is going to be fun. <laughs> we're going to check under the sink, um, under the desk, and look at Yorn as he's doing that. No, we're going to hear some from some guest speakers. And we have some really good guest speakers who are um, going to drive us in our discussion around um, localization. So we're honored to have the director of the Bureau for Disaster Management and Response from the Philippines, um, Mr. Clifford Rivero. And Mr. Rivero is, is in the middle, if you haven't been watching the news, um, they're actually in the middle of responding to a typhoon right now. So we're very honored that he can be with us. We have the head of the Somali NGO Consortium, which actually has 110 members, which is way more than the CCCM cluster. So um, we're very honored to have Ms. Nemo Hassan together with us to present some ideas on coordination. And then we have two inspiring local NGOs, and I, I would hardly call them local NGOs because they have such a far reach and they have more than just their own programming that they're responsible for. We're going to hear from my friend Anjar Raditya from Human Initiatives, and we're going to hear from Mr. Yaksan Shish. Uh, oh, Yaksan, I've been practicing your name so much too. Shashakli, there, I got it, um, from the Merim Foundation. And uh, Merim Foundation is working in Syria. So we have a lot of interesting presentations coming. And then we're going to go to breakout groups and try to unravel what we mean by the concept of localization in as much as it's um, for CCCM. So I, I want to start this discussion and just kind of frame the topic for us before we get into it. And five years ago, in the retreat of 2015, I was actually astonished to learn that we had a session called localization. And this is the picture from the breakout group. And I was looking for people that I recognized. And I was wishing that the um, discussion that we had yesterday about how many people were so old in the sector could be juxtaposed against this one because the people that I see here are different. And if you'll remember correctly that it was actually the World Humanitarian Summit that kind of set the principles around localization and that was in 2016. So this was before we were having the, um, before the WHS, we were having this discussion about localization and the highlights of the session were that it was um, talking about the role of local actors and there was a hotelier, a woman um, who had run a hotel in Nepal and opened it up for displaced people after the earthquake there and she was extremely inspiring. And then there was a presentation from the subcluster um, co-lead who it was in Myanmar talking about the, um, the challenges with the authorities kind of setting the participants who would be part of the, um, the governance structure in Myanmar in Sitwe. And then we had a presentation from the government of the Philippines to talk about the disaster management relief framework and the al alignment kind of about avoiding increased risks. 
And I'm wondering about those presentations because they were coming at a time in which localization hadn't really kind of permeated into our, our topics of, um, of CCCM. And it's, it's always good to learn from your mistakes, I think. And I revisited that discussion um, and, and thinking about this presentation because what we mean by localization may have really different kinds of understanding. So we thought that we would launch a poll to really understand if we mean the same thing by localization and how can we get closer to that definition. So Juan, I'm going to ask you to launch the poll and you can see a definition up there. But we're going to like find out of those of you that are online right now, like what is what best describes your view of localization? What do you think of when you would try to describe it to a friend? Is this just like some weird um, UN jargon? Is this some um, terminology that you have a responsibility for? I see no one taking the poll. So that means me makes me kind of sad. Please. If you can take the poll. Oh, good, great. Now we have one responder. Thank you. So take a minute for it to flow through. Okay, good. I also have um, maybe lagging in my my connections here, but so you can see that kind of views of localization can have a wide range. It can be a kind of superficial translation of training materials. It can be fundraising for national NGOs. It can be promoting a platform of trust for coordination. It can take on more of the responsibilities that you may have to promote localization, which would be maybe technical capacity building, hiring local implementing partners, nationalizing the cluster system. So we have maybe a, a, a pretty good mix there between um, nationalizing the cluster system and technical capacity building. I think that that's an interesting mix. It's still a pretty, like one third of the group. Oh, it says 50%. Okay, now I can see that, good. We'll give it maybe a minute more so that then we can freeze those results. But we see we don't have a unified view about what is localization and how you might describe that. No one puts in translation of training materials. That's good. I'm glad about that. If you scroll down, you can see the next question, which is who's responsible for championing localization in the cluster system? And I guess I don't mean outside the cluster system. We're, we're friends and family here. We're talking about CCCM. So who's responsible for it? We talk a lot about roles and responsibilities. Um, and I see that right now cluster coordinators are responsible for it. And I wonder why cluster coordinators get this responsibility among all their other responsibilities, but that is what the trend is, that it is um, largely falling to cluster coordinators. as opposed to local actors who may have access to the population or governments who may wanna be able to set those regulatory policies. Okay, so this was um, more to get your temperature about the diversity of views out there and about the diversity of um, opinions about what is localization and then who would be responsible within CCCM to do that. Cynthia, do you wanna make any comments on the poll? No, I mean, um, especially the, the second question, I, I think that we're quite divided and I think it's it's almost a quarter each, almost, though cluster coordinator take the lead. And I think it reflects the fact that we that we see um, a, a certain ownership at different levels. And, and I'm, I'm looking forward to, to see, to discuss that more in the, in the upcoming discussions. Thanks. So let's go ahead and end the poll. And We'll share the results. And then exit the poll. Good.
So I just want to throw back up because we do have some people who are kind of new to the CCCM cluster that we do have this kind of generic roles and responsibilities in CCCM framework that we are a shared group of responsibilities. And so like Cynthia was saying that the, the, um, the, the ideas that localization is shared between different people, I think it is also reflected in our CCCM framework. But I just want to remind everybody that the CCCM framework works best when each of the components, so those working at site level, those working at coordination level, and those working in the administrative level, know what to do in their role and that they're all working for, and if I could see other participants other than people whose screens are off, I would say this achievement of the CCCM goals for this gold star right in the middle. And I just want to be very overt and say that, you know, contrary to what um, the kind of cluster system is meant to do, that we know that CCCM is also a sector and that these functions exist whether the cluster is activated or not and that the terminology is going to vary and that the actors are going to vary within each specific context. So, but we, in every single function, you're going to have these three components needing to achieve the goals together and that by pulling together, you'll be able to achieve those goals. So with that in mind, um, I'd really like to introduce our three panelists and to kind of get their views. And as they're going through their presentations, I want you to be thinking about the place where you work. And I want you to be thinking, do you have the right tools to be able to achieve CCCM goals with all three components doing their role to fulfill their role together to achieve the CCCM framework? So do you have the right guidance? Do you have the right tools? So think about your place as they're making their presentations, because I think that will be a more meaningful way of watching their presentations. So let me introduce our guest speakers because it's more introducing, interesting to hear from them. So um, Director Clifford Rivero from the government of the Philippines. Um, Director Rivero, are you there? Can we have you unmuted, please? I'd like to- Yes, I'm here. Good morning. I, good morning I, to you. Good, good evening, Mabuhay. Mabuhay. <laughs> it's now 9 p.m. here. 9 p.m. Okay, and, and you you are um, joining us, I think, from your home, but you're also in the midst of the of the typhoon response. Can you just tell us a little bit how is it going with with the with the typhoon? Well, we're uh, in uh, we are more, we are badly hit in uh, in central uh, central part of the Philippines and uh and it was almost uh it was it was devastating and uh, we, of course we have to put ourselves together and uh, go there and reinforce build the place back to make it return to the mainstreams of the economy yeah, well, thank you so much for joining us in the midst of being um, also responsible for a disaster. I know you have a lot of um, experience. You had 36 years with the Philippine Army before joining your current position, and that you were also part of the other disaster responses, including high end. So some of our colleagues also on the call today were there with you responding to high end. So you're, you're in good company, and we're, we're so grateful for your leadership and taking the time to talk to us today. You've Thank prepared you. a quick video and I, I'd like to show the video to everyone on, this, on, the, on the platform. And then we'll come back and ask you some other questions if that's all right. So yes, Juan, if, if you can start the video, that would be um, really great right now. I can't hear. There's no sound. Uh, Jen and the colleagues, I think we are facing the same problem we faced yesterday. No, sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. 
paid by the department of the disaster response management group of the department of social welfare and development from the government of the philippines i will be presenting to you the philippine version of the implementation of the cccm experience the Philippines is located at the Pacific Ring of Fire in the Typhoon Belt. It is exposed to several geological and hydro meteorological hazards. These hazards, plus human induced hazards, cause massive internal displacement each year. As state actors, it is our primary responsibility to ensure that our internally displaced persons, especially the most vulnerable sectors, are provided with protection and assistance. In 2008, the National Disaster Coordinating Council adopted the cluster system approach. This designated DSWD as a cluster head of the camp coordination and camp management. In 2010, our president, President Billy Nakino III, signed the Republic Act 10121 or the Philippine Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Act. This law paved the way for the institutionalization of a proactive DRRM approach. In 2013, DSWD led the issuance of the Joint Memorandum Circular on Evacuation Center Coordination and Management, adopting the SPEAR Standards and Global CCCM Toolkit. In 2017, the NDRRMC, through the response pillar, issued a National Disaster Response Plan that further adopts a cluster system approach. DSWD remains the lead agency of the CCCM cluster. In 2018, DSWD developed the national training program on CCCM and protection. It was also the same year that DSWD entered into the Empowering National Government Agencies Emergencies Engage project with the International Organization for Migration, or IOM, supported by the United States Agency for International Development, or USAID, Bureau for Humanitarian Assistance. In 2019, the SWD field offices started cascading the NTP for CCCM to the local government units. The partnership between IOM and the SWD enabled the conduct of the series of CCCM training for trainers completed the same year. Furthermore, the CCCM team conducted evacuation center monitoring with local government units to ensure awareness and compliance with standards. The insights gained from previous disaster response operations and consultations with LGUs became our impetus to enhance our policies on CCCM. In 2020, the SWD, with support from CCCM member agencies, develop an amendment to the Joint Memorandum Circular on EC Coordination and Management. This new draft incorporates protection, information management, infection prevention, and control measures, and the latest SPEAR standards. The department also issued the CCCM and Protection COVID-19 Operational Guidance to prevent COVID-19 transmission inside camps. Our CCCM localization experience can be summed up in three words, engage, link, and institutionalize. On engaging with multi-level stakeholders, this ranges from seeking the participation of IDPs in camp activities and decision-making to consulting with LGUs, regional office, and national government agencies. We also engage with the civil society organizations and international NGOs such as IOM through a formal agreement with DSWD, cementing a partnership with clear expected outcomes, roles, and responsibilities, and mutual commitments. On linking global CCCM guidelines, frameworks with existing national, local guidelines and frameworks through consultation workshops, coordination, capacity building activities, involving other relevant government and non-government stakeholders in the process. We also included linking together the solutions to displacements, information management, and protection for proactive and harmonized response strategy. All the last is 
institutionalizing, adopted, and localized guidelines into memorandum circulars, national training programs, simulation exercise designs, and local DRRM plans. These guide local government units who act as the first responders, camp administrators, camp coordinators, and camp managers on the ground during providing protection and assistance to our IDPs and ensuring that these follow humanitarian standards and community participation is a continuous effort and advocacy of our department. We always put in mind that as we deliver services to our constituents, we contribute to our overall Philippine DRRM objective, building safer, adaptive, and disaster resilient Filipino communities towards sustainable development. Thank you very much, Director. Um, there have there are on on this platform. I happen to know that there's quite a few countries coming from Asia Pacific, and they're my friends. And I'm I'm wondering if you would be willing to answer a kind of impromptu question, which is, if if you can think about maybe one of the you talked about you know kind of engaging institutionalizing and preparing, but those are big concepts. And I would say, you know, what's been the biggest challenge that you've faced? in the integration process of bringing CCTM into your national protocols? Because I think that that would be really, that's a big question, but that would be like really the best question that would be there for colleagues from, um, from Indonesia, I'm thinking about from colleagues, you know, like how did you, how did you, how did you do that? How did you get institutionalization to engage, link and prepare um, in the Philippines? Was that just the adoption of the cluster system in 2010, or was there something else that you can say really brought you there? Actually, the, the CCCM cluster, oh, uh, you say it, 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 it evolved. If you, if you go back to the timeline, it evolved in... Uh, in so many ways that uh, we are learning from the mistakes that we had from uh, from the previous years. So in in my presentation earlier, you would there was a part there that uh, mentioned about the various kinds of disaster we've been we've been through, both natural and human induced. So from there we try to we try to change, and uh, currently this year. As we rewrote our policy, our guidelines, we had to change again this by including the hardest part, which is uh, involving the COVID. COVID, the COVID-19, this pandemic, is, uh, became a challenge for us as uh, there are evacuation centers that are not really that, that large and uh, we, we don't have enough space. So we have to maintain the social distancing. We have to ensure that the medical facilities are there, the medical responders are there. If there are anything that uh, would uh, take place, we just, we just try to ensure that all the members of the, the government agencies like the police, the health, the utilities, they're all there or if not, ready to be ready to assist us in our in our call for them thank you i i like what you said that that we evolved and that we were ready to learn and i think that that's some that's somehow very humbling because it means that when you when you get it wrong that you try again and that you don't give up and i really i really appreciate how um how kind that answer is and how generous that, because that's really inspiring to us. Um, all of us that are trying our best, but maybe through the circumstance, haven't been able to like get it exactly right. So um, there's more questions coming to you, but I, I'm gonna switch to our next panelist because in our, in our next part of the CCTM framework, we also have this kind of coordination role. 
And the government of the Philippines is fortunate to have such a strong capacity, but in areas where there isn't such a strong capacity, um, the CCCM cluster plays a, a different coordination role than they do in um, countries that are well prepared and that have strong systems that can support them. So um, I'm going to switch to our next presenter, which is um, Ms. Nima Hassan from the NGO with from the Somali NGO consortium. And um, Nimo, I know that you're new to your role. I was doing a little bit of research on you last night, um, but I don't know so much about the the NGO consor the Somali NGO consortium, other than what you told me that it's both national and international NGOs. So why don't you give us like a two minute primer um, and help us to to up our membership as you are doing on on yours because you have so many more members than we do. So can you tell us about the Somali NGO consortium and, and hello, thank you for being with us. Yes, um, I will definitely thank you for having me. Uh, good afternoon from Somalia to everyone. Um, I apologize in advance on my loose connection uh, bandwidth uh, today and yesterday has been playing up. So I might um, just um, go to audio. Um, but yes, uh, I am certainly new to the, uh, the role, um, but the Somali NGO Consortium has been in existence since um, I think 1999. Um, and um, has been evolving and, of course, changing strategies and main um, uh, agenda for, for, for the Somali NGO Consortium. Um, it's sort of um, providing a platform for NGOs, both uh, national and international, to have a common platform where they uh, coordinate um, their efforts and programming and, and advocacy. Um, either towards the government or whether it's humanitarian or development or relationship with the UN. So basically it's a forum where the, the membership uh, is, is for the membership, is to support the membership, but it's also for the membership to utilize the platform to advance the agenda, um, to have a common voice, to coordinate, um, as you said in your opening remarks, um, Somalia is a complex uh, country where the government is not strong. Um, it's still in a, um, you know, complex humanitarian needs. Um, and as such, um, um, the Somali NGO uh, Forum plays a role to sort of bring together all the various different act actors and stakeholders to have a common approach to development um, in, in, in terms of the messaging, the design um, and uh, funding. Um, so it sort of it acts as a bridge between the uh, beneficiaries, the vulnerable people that we're trying to um, support and our implementers, whether it's um, um, national or international and other stakeholders that we are um, in the same field as both as the UN agencies and also the, the government in the various different levels. Um, so yeah. Um, it, it's, it's a forum, <laughs> basically. Um, it's a demanding forum. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's quite a challenging role to be in, um, and uh, I'm still learning uh, as well. <laughs> that gives us a good background, and thank you. I didn't mean to put you on the spot, um, but yes, uh, we're going to hear a lot about your, um, your advice about how to make a uh, this bridges of, of platforms around NGO membership uh, in the breakout session a little bit more. You've also prepared a video for us about some of the challenges in coordination and particularly coming from the point of view of how local NGOs might have challenges in relationship to the localization agenda. So Juan, if you can play Nemo's video, then that can kind of introduce that topic and deepen it a bit more for us. It is a pleasure to be here to talk briefly about how um, a few challenges that have been encountered or associated with localization and um, particularly coordination here in Somalia. Um, I want to mention three um, challenges. Um, one, um, the language. 
And this is not about English or Somali, it's about the language that is particular to the humanitarian sector, um, including technical terminologies or jargon associated with a particular sector, um, which can affect the meaningful participation of local actors in the cost coordination uh, platform. Um, particularly when many local actors do not have the resources to fully dedicate um, the staff uh, to join in all the coordination meetings and follow all the discussions. Um, second, the second challenge I want to mention here is the sector-based approach to coordination. Many of the local NGOs um, here have been responding to um, needs on the ground as they arise uh, based on their capacity and expertise so don't necessarily have the um, time or additionally trying to understand humanitarian uh, language uh, local NGOs have to relearn the division of responsibilities of sectors to figure out where they best fit um, here the issue can also be the lack of information sharing across and between the sectors um, which can lead to missed opportunities for more, more meaningful coordination that might amplify the impact um, of our programming. With efforts either repeated or replicated in the various sectors. Um, so to minimizing and impacting on the harmonization across the different clusters. For local actors with limited resources, many are finding what they do fit into a number of sectors which require them to join multiple coordination meetings and platforms. Which leads to my third and last point, um, coordination takes money and capacity. At the same time, to get funding you have to be seen to coordinate. Um, this relates to the power dynamics in coordination, how can cluster create safe spaces for local actors with their views and opinions may well impact whether they get funding or not. Um, in some instances, sharing of leadership roles with local actors can put others at ease and create a, a more sense of um, partnership. Um, though I must stress that this cannot happen in a meaningful way without resources and capacity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nemo. You um, you brought up the question. You you answered the question, which was, which I was going to ask you. I don't know if someone. Um, shared with you, but um, I, I was going to ask you specifically about this this challenge with um, with staff and with the fact that in in bringing in the cluster system and even the sector system that um, that it takes so many more people to be able to like sit in all these different coordination forums, particularly with CCCM, which is a cross cutting sector. Um, and and how do you how do you how do you encourage um, local organizations that have to triple hat, um, even sometimes UN organizations have to double or triple hat. So how do you, how do you, what advice do you have for us on this? Um, thank you, Jen, for the question. Um, I, I mean, I guess um, for, for the local NGOs is just do your best, <laughs> of course, and, and in, partic in the particular context of of um, Somalia access to also a question. So a lot of the um, um, time, um, local are given um, part of the cost. They are the ones who can access certain areas where international or UN agencies are unable to do that. Um, so, so they are um, given programs which, uh, you, know, huma you know, humanitarian, needs based to provide to those um, in areas but might not necessarily be, be given the the administrative support or um, to attract you know um, um, skilled and talented staff and um, usually um, whenever staff are trained within 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 a certain area or the um, the um, local NGO uh, then the uh, international NGOs still does start from them. So this this circle goes. 
and I think we have lost the connection. Amplify because so. Am I audible? You are now. We lost you for a second. Please hear me now. I dis. Okay. Okay. So I disconnected the video. I think the bandwidth cannot. Uh, <laughs> I think the video and the um, the audio. Um, so I think my um, going back to the question, my main advice would be um, you still have to be at the table. So try and participate as many coordinations as possible, um, network, um, um, and uh, really sort of assert the value that you have. And I'm and I'm glad, you know, the the the, the direction of the discussion is going towards you know, the localization agenda and advancing, advancing the localization agenda. So I think change takes time. Um, so bear with it, uh, do your best. And also there's a need to improve the internal local um, um, uh, coordination within the local NGOs. There are various bigger local NGOs that tend to access a lot of the funding or have stronger partnerships with INGOs or the UN agencies. And there's a lot of smaller, local actors who are struggling so i think there also needs to be an internal uh, coordination between the local actors themselves i think you know that will give you uh, more strength um to a bigger voice basically so i think um, yeah I, i'll leave it at that there's there's a couple things that we're going to pick up on in the next two presenters and and one is this idea of access which is going to come up in in a in a second in relationship to um the presentation from yakzan but i would say even this this whole idea of like um the the added value and the coordination between local ngos is really relevant um to our next presenter to to anjar and um Human Initiative has been working since the early um, early 1991. Is that right? Am I remembering your history correctly, Anjar? It's 1999. 1999. Okay, I've got my my nines and my ones mixed up. Um, but but you have such a, a vast country in Indonesia, and I think people tend to think of Indonesia as either urban Jakarta. Or um, or Bali, and I think that there's there's a lot in between um, Jakarta and Bali, and so maybe you can just tell us a little bit about Human Initiative before we turn to you and and hear your perspective as a local NGO um, thinking about the CCTM framework because you're new to CCTM and you're coming from being a really big NGO with with a particular background and a particular talent um but maybe tell us a little bit about your ngo and then we'll watch your video and come back to a question for you so anjar over to you thank you my respect to the previous speakers um uh, you guys are uh, really uh, uh experienced in, in in this and as uh, jennifer has said uh, we're very new actually uh uh now about uh a human initiative. Human initiative. Uh, well, we were first established in 1999, uh, but the actual work uh, of our founders started since 1998. Uh, it was it was in response uh, to the uh, Asian uh, monetary uh, monetary crisis, uh, the economic crisis that we we experienced uh, in the Southeast Asian during 1998, 97, 98. And so uh, the aftermath caused uh, a lot of uh, social unrest. Uh, and so we responded to that uh, through a movement of, uh, because we, we were not established yet. Uh, but then uh, our supporters, donors, uh, who are individuals actually, but the public, uh, they, they, they supported us and they, they wished for us to be legit uh, legally uh, work uh, for more uh, of what the country or the people need, uh, uh, especially uh, economically and, and, and uh, 
facing through all the problems that that uh, raised um, after the the, the the crisis and um, and so the support from from the public uh, have uh, have been great ever since and now 20 one year later, uh, we have 11 branch offices and uh, have programs that uh, reach 34 provinces of the country. Uh, and um, and uh, we have also responded to, uh, to, uh, uh, to the work uh, or to the uh, humanitarian causes uh, uh, even overseas, but these are also uh, provided uh, by the support of the uh, the Indonesian public that that uh, urges us to uh, to also respond. So uh, I, I guess that's uh, pretty much it about, uh, about who we are, uh, Human Initiative. Eleven branch offices. So I mean, I guess have that in mind. And um, Juan, if you'll play the the video from HI. Um, Andrew, we'll, we'll watch your video and then we'll come back. I see some questions coming in the chat and they're the same ones that I've um, that I've asked as well. So, um, Hello, my name is Sanjar Radite and I am working in Human Initiative, a humanitarian foundation headquartered in Indonesia. Indonesia is a country located at the meeting point of three major continental plates. It is located on one of the corners of the Pacific Ring of Fire, uh, where 90% of all earthquakes occurs. Indonesians have lived among uh, many kinds of disasters, from tsunami to uh, nowadays extreme weather, like tornadoes, where, which have caused displacement of peoples uh, in bigger magnitude of disasters. Because of this, Indonesia is named by many as the supermarket of disaster. Cluster system, mostly activated in times of disaster. Cluster system in national level is led by the national government, the central government, supported by international NGO. Sorry, Paraji, this is my, my issue. I, uh, where 90% of all earthquakes occurs. Indonesians have lived among uh, many kinds of disasters, from tsunami to uh, nowadays extreme weather, like tornadoes, where, which have caused displacement of peoples uh, in bigger magnitude of disasters. Because of this, Indonesia is named by many as the supermarket of disaster. Cluster system, mostly activated in times of disaster. Cluster system in national level is led by the national government, the central government, supported by international NGO or UN agencies, which coordinate with UN OCHA and local and or national NGO as well, like we are. Now, local NGOs are welcome to join the cluster meetings. Uh, unfortunately, most of the time, a lot of them uh, stop coordinating after several few meetings. This is mostly due to the gap of uh, capacity. Human Initiative uh, works uh, in sectors like wash, uh, shelter, logistics, food security, and nutrition. Human Initiative referred to the humanitarian charter where humanitarian action should be imperative. That action should be taken to prevent or alleviate human suffering arising out of disaster or conflict. Uh, we have experienced several uh, localization initiatives by several uh, international NGO partners. Uh, the Catholic Relief Service, uh, for example, have trained us for more than three years in uh, a program called Preparing to Excel in Emergency, PEER for short. The CCM, Camp Management, uh, with IOM were just recently introduced uh, to us uh, in order for us to implement with all the necessary uh, adjustment, of course, that we consider is fit for uh, Indonesia's context and human initiatives values. Uh, other international NGOs, uh, of course, have also shared uh, some of their key knowledge on uh, disaster response. 
As organizations which gain benefit from uh, localization, we have delivered uh, the knowledge we obtain to other local partner NGOs. And we also have done so to journalists uh, by conducting various workshops and trainings, ensuring Indonesia's vast needs of quick and uh, proper response is met with the required standards. We, we noted uh, an immediate positive impact after the triple CM training uh, we obtained from IOM. Uh, the case was in Palu, where there was uh, IDPs uh, at the, uh, a complex uh, of a masjid or mosque. Uh, they were one of the most challenging problems to be solved by the local government. At the same time, the, the, there was a reconstruction progress uh, that, that progresses uh, on the on the on the complex or the the mosque. Now, uh, this makes the complex full of ruins and materials, which is dangerous for the IDSPs, especially children, to live. Our team, uh, using participatory approach that we learned uh, during the triple CM uh, uh, training, well, our team was able to identify what the community really needs and some FGDs were also done. And participation uh, also include balanced number of men, women, people with disabilities or their representatives. In the end, the triple CM training have provided us with the knowledge to conduct better management of refugees in camps in central Sulawesi. Thank you for, uh, for uh, attending this session. Uh, you are welcome to, uh, to provide comments on, uh, on my presentation. Thank you. Andre, there's a side chat happening on my phone that's really a fan of calling it the triple CM. And you don't realize how much we talk about renaming the the CCCM cluster. So like the triple CM, I think you've, you've started a trend. Um, watch for it on one social media tonight. I, I want to ask you one quick question and then a longer question. And, the, and you said, you said refugees, and I don't speak Bahasa, but there's going to be some people flipping out right now because this is the for the IDPs. So just tell us what what in Bahasa what what that means. Well, uh, uh, it's uh, it, it's 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 similar to displaced people uh, or or, or uh, pengungsi. Uh, uh, pengungsi is people who uh, who are uh, uh, either uh, they move from their house uh, voluntarily because of uh, or or forced to because uh, of disaster or, or or some other reason so 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 they have to move out of their home and therefore they ngungsi or pengungsi and and that's that, that's how we also refer to as a refugee <laughs> It's okay. So, uh, I just I want to I want to make sure that nobody's uncomfortable with the fact that you that you said that, and we realize that. Um, <laughs> no, it's it's great. It's actually really useful, and it's it's spot on in relationship to localization, right? It's not just about the terminology; it's about the terminology and how it's understood in the context. So that was really good. I'm going to ask you one more question because I, I do need to get to Yakdan and I know everybody else wants to answer question, ask you questions as well. Um, my question is in, in one word or in two words, tell me the most challenging thing of working with UN agencies and with large international forums like this. Speak uh, truth to power. Oh, uh, uh one is uh well it's not one or two words it's uh, a gap in uh, capacity and the other one is uh, uh, uh commitment or uh, committed to uh, to the standards uh while well uh, for for uh, i mean humanitarian for a, 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 of our or, or local local humanitarian foundation we would we would 
in the beginning we we were only uh, focusing on 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 getting the the job done or getting the people to safety uh, to better condition uh standards were were not uh, as big of an issue back then uh, but then after the capacity it's uh, it's, it's it's a requirement it's uh, it, it provides uh, dignity to the people which is which is also important Uh, and then uh, it, it provides protections, uh, and that's that's also uh, something to uh, that uh, we consider very much now. So uh, yeah, it's uh, uh, th those are some some of the things: standards, uh, knowledge. Those are some of the biggest uh, gap uh, that, uh, that 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 we were provided before beforehand. Thank you for that. That gives us a lot to think about. And it's actually a really good segue into um, our, our last presentation. And Yaxan, are you there? Yep. Hi. Hi. Um, it, it's amazing to me how this conversation, which is videos from different people around the world, is connected in so many different ways. And And I'm, I'm, I'm actually quite emotional about it because I didn't see the thread um, before when I was looking at them individually and collectively, there's so much um, that's coming from that. And I know um, you're, you're coming to us from Turkey. Uh, you have a foundation, um, the Merum Foundation, which was started um, with with the story of a young girl in an olive grove. And maybe maybe just for um, people that aren't familiar with your foundation, you could first um, talk about that and then we'll show your video and, and then get a chance to get questions kind of deepening this discussion about how critical it is to have local NGOs who have access and building upon the, the previous speakers. So Yaksan, over to you. Sure, Jenny. And, uh... Well, it's great to hear all the experiences from around the world. And actually, it's really, I mean, it's been our knowledge and our capacity in different level. Let me tell you about Maram. When we started Maram, we started with, again, just like any other local NGOs, uh, locals, and actually expats. Me, myself, I, I used to live in the States and moved to Syria just to support as a volunteer. And because of the necessity, we found ourselves, we have to register organization and go formally. But what, the difference where we started, we started, to, first thing we did is to build a camp. We did not have experience. We did not know anything. We were like, those IDPs are living at the border. Let's build a camp for them. And this is how we started. And we did not know what camp is. We, I mean, me personally, I looked online. I was like, camp is tents, people, and that's what, all what we need. So we started the building camps and there was no actually uh, UN presence at the time. And there was no, Uh, not too many INGOs at the time, one or two. So we started building a camp. And from that start, we found ourselves in the middle of something big, <laughs> something requiring more experience, more capacity, more knowledge, and a lot of other things. And then we slowly, we start build our capacity to get to the level where we work now. We are one of the biggest in Syria. We work in the camps, we do camp management, and we do like protection on other clusters. Thank you. Um, Juan, if we can play the, um, it, do you want to set up the video at all, Yaxan? What are we going to see in your video? Because it's it's a little bit different than the others. So what I did, I mean, I, I wanted to show the situation in the camps in Syria. What difference about the disaster we have in Syria? It's not a normal humanitarian disaster. We have a war that's been there for nine years. And for some of like the, I see some people who works in Syria, nine years, the war did not stop. So people are moving for the past nine years and that's a huge challenge. So I wanted to show what is the situation on the ground and later talk about our difficulties and about the problems we have as a local NGO. Thanks. Sorry, just want to double check that I have done everything right before I share. أشبه بالكاميسة 
الذي خيم على رؤوس السوريين ليكون ذاك الكابوس أكثر الكوابيس ميلانا بحق الكثيرين ممن أجبروا على التخلي عن منازلهم خصيصا قاتلي مناطق المخيمات الذين تجاوزت أعدادهم المليون ونصف نازل على مختلف الأصعدة وأينما توجهت بناظره لن ترى أمامك سوى مشاهد المعاناة المنتشرة كالنار في المشيل فكل تفاصيل الحياة الصغيرة والكبيرة على صعيد البأوى والمسكة توزعت مخيمات النازحين على طول المناطق الحدودية مع تركيا لتكون مأسات السوريين أحد أكبر مأس المدونة في القرن الحادي والعشرين علاوة عن الوضع المعيشي الذي بات يشكل أحد أكبر التهديدات للنازح خصيصا مع تقلبات العملة الكثيرة وانخفاض مفتقري للطعام والشراب والمي، المي اهم شيء، خزانات مي ما عندنا. وبدنا مدارس، اهم شيء المدارس، تعليم. فصل الشتاء اشد فصول المعاناة ذرة. لا تكاد الامطار ان تلامس الارض حتى تبدا نداءات الاستغاثة تنطلق كاصوات رعد الشتاء. مؤمنة مئات الموارد والاطراف. والسيولة التي لا تبدي ولا تنهي. عندنا معاناة كثيرة سيئة. طريق الكمية الزيت ما نحن نقدر نشتريها اثناء الغلاء، الخبز، حتى الاكل اللي عم ناكله ناشف بدون ذلك. وضعنا هنا سيء كثير كثير لاخر درجة. بالعودة إلى الجانب التعليمي. أنا عمري 11 سنة بطلع لايم نايلون من الحاويات مشان بيعون وجيب حق خبز لأهلي بس أنا أحب أروح المدرسة بس ما في مدرسة هوني ما في مدرسة الذي لم يعد يفرق بين الحياة والموت والتي جعلته يعي تماما ما هو معنى الموت على قيد الحياة I really apologize for the sound quality. I, I and I see people leaning in and trying to 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 see what it is like in the camps in Syria. And so, thank you so much for showing us that. The videos will be available um, on the CCCM YouTube channel, and we'll try to improve the sound on that one because it may just be the playing it over so many different platforms. But. Um, I feel like there's more you want to tell us about what's happening in Syria right now. And we really, we have about two more minutes until we need to take a break, but I, um, everybody's wrapped on what you might, might tell us. Sure, I'll go quick. I mean, the camps in Syria, just like any camps all over the world, I mean, camps is camps. We, I mean, no matter what we do, camps is not the best place to live. But the part, what's happening in Syria, the camps are not only emergency, it's been emergency for nine years. So even the way, uh, UN, UN agencies and INGOs and treating the situation as an emergency. So even as you say, uh, as you've seen inside the video, school is not there, not, live, not enough livelihood, uh, livelihood programs, and people are still 
uh, fighting for hope is more than the living situation. And this is what we're really fighting for as a local NGO, to give people hope. And we are facing our locals, our families, and then uh, trying to help them. And again, we're facing the international humanitarian world where other uh, requirements, where they don't match with the people need. And this is where the biggest challenge we have right now. Um, the biggest challenge that we have right now is really to be able to, to meet all of the needs that are there. And we can't do that alone. I mean, I guess this is what, what really this shows. And I've really appreciated this conversation because um, I, I can see the connections that um, are between all of the different presentations and how we each need to have more capacity to be able to, to meet those needs and that we, we can't do it alone. Um, and that we absolutely need each other to be able to um, better eat, meet the needs of people that are in the, in the worst circumstances right now. And, and I think that um, that's, that's one thing that the um, CCM cluster is all committed to. So I'll, I'll allow um, one question from the, from the participants um, to you. And Cynthia, I, I'm hoping that you've chosen the best one. Um, and then we'll, we'll go to a quick break because I don't want to. Yeah, of course. I think there were quite a quite a few questions, and I, and I, I think that it was related to to um, um, the, the 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 second presentation. But I do think that it applies to everyone. It was about the language and humanitarian lingo, and um, and I and I th there was this question on on what can be. Hold on, I'm, I'm gonna, I, I wanna respect the, 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 <laughs> the accuracy of the questions because there were two that were quite interesting. I'm trying to find a way to put them together. Uh, one was asking if, if local organizations sometimes find the humanitarian bureaucracy difficult to navigate. And, um, and another person said that the challenge is often in countries where um, you know, um, institutional capacity is greatly affected. Um, and and, and they, they were talking about power structure as well. So the question is, I'm, I'm bearing, bear with me. The question is, what can be done by not only international actors, but local actors in terms of, of bridging the gap in terms of language and humanitarian lingo while not affecting the local know-how? <laughs> this is the question too, Cynthia. You're on mute. Maybe we could start with Nemo. Okay, um, it's such a great question, but I think um, it's also a question that looks at, at the bigger picture, I think, of the, of the whole humanitarian sector or the whole development aid. Um, I, think, I think there needs to be a balance uh, between uh, providing supporting capacities and not uh, affecting the know-how. Um, and I think it's just through these discussions and forums like this, and I think, um, um, I, you know, I, meaningful participation and not necessarily just thinking of, let's tick the boxes um, in, in saying, okay, we provided training capacity building to local NGOs, now it's up to them to, to do the um, um, more um, effective participation of these cluster meetings. I think there really needs to be, um, uh, a better, more engagement in uh, bringing, bridging the, the fact that you, that, you know, there is an, a need and necessary to um, build the capacity of the local NGOs, um, but then also providing the platform for them to be able to take the leadership. And um, because as we said earlier about the power dynamics as well, that plays a bigger role on, on how you, um, uh, participate in a discussion depending on who's listening depending on who's in the audience and what you think the cons what you perceive maybe not necessarily what, it, what will happen but what you perceive the outcome to be so I think um, through discussions and open discussions frank discussions I think maybe the you know the, 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 there will be a, a bridging of the of, of the, you know ensuring this capacitated um, staff or institutions as well as you know, um, preserving the know-how and um, of, of the local uh, uh, context. 
um, I'll give chance for other speakers to, to um, respond. I don't know which other speaker would like to respond. I will I'll, I'll jump here because what we're really looking for and what we're missing actually real partnership. We, as a local NGO, we feel like a subcontractor of the job. It's just like you're bringing, you're getting the contract as a, a UN agencies or international NGO, and they come to us to do the subcontract. They tell you, do one, two, three, and don't think. And this is actually the main problem. And we're facing it day by day. Even with all the meetings we, we try to show, even the lo all, all the localization meetings and you know seminars and the fancy things, we don't see that. After the meetings, we still are the subcontractor of the work. Unless we do a real, par real partnership, partnership and capacity building not to do uh, only the way you want it. It's capacity building is to build our capacity to be your partner, not to implement your project. And this is where we're facing. And this is, we're still facing in Syria and as a local NGO. And this is, I mean, I will not generalize because there's some partners that are great and hopefully they're meeting, uh, they're here, they can listen to us. But again, there's some partners, they're still treating the local NGO as a subcontractor. And to get over that, we need actually all together because at some point the local NGOs who remain and keep doing the work because it's uh, our family, our land, that's where we're gonna stay. And the international agencies will leave and we will face the problems at the meantime, they will go somewhere else. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Jackson. Um, we're gonna go to a break Jennifer, and- here. This is Omar Dabao, quickly, please. Yes, of course. Yeah, thank you. Because I, I, I was in a different context, uh, Greece, um, uh, Bangladesh, Iraq, of course, I started here. And um, recently I just came back from, uh, from the cross-border operation in Syria. So, um, Speaking the, the localization, I think we need to, as the colleagues said, uh, many colleagues said that there is a need to standardize or um, improve the, the, the language. And I totally understand that because I, I graduated as an aeronautical engineer and you know all the pilots and the, the people working in the aviation are speaking the same language. So I think number one, to standardize our CCM language, by the way, thank you for the CCC Amers, which is very good expression. Um, the second point is uh, to just to answer Mr. Yakzan, um, usually the partners sending their own project concept notes and the proposals. And based on that, we develop the response plan. But Sometimes, and here is the need for the capacity building, sometimes they, the, the, the NGOs doesn't show enough capacity to, to uh, develop those proposals. So based on the actual need that we are receiving through the uh, service monitoring tools, we go and, and, and start telling, can you do this, can you do that? But it's, it's not really, we are asking them to be a, a, a co-contractor uh, co or, or subcontractors, as Mr. Yakzan said. Um, speaking also localization, I would suggest that we need to consider also the localization or contextualize the contingency and, and emergency plans up to the, or down to the camp level. And also we need to, to localize the, the um, response at every single uh, country over. Thank you. Omar, you've, you've brought us really exactly where we wanna go with the breakout groups. So you just launched us straight into the breakout groups. Thank you very much. Um, we need to take a break because I think um, we I said, I, you know, sunrise to sunset here. We need to, to get a cup of coffee. Um, as you are leaving to get your cup of coffee or to stretch your legs and stand up, um, think about which breakout group you want to go to. Uh, we have 
a very illustrious team. Thank you very much, Juan. I was thinking like seven, eight. Um, we have eight different breakout groups because um, we wanted to be able to have a more intimate discussion. And panelists, I really invite you to join a breakout group as well. We'll be having two sessions on preparedness and localization, really thinking about what you can do before a disaster hits. We have four sessions on capacity building because capacity building has come up in every single one of the panelists discussions. We'll be having those in four different languages, English, French, Spanish, and Arabic. So please choose the language where you feel most confident to speak. And we'll be having a eighth group that's four and two is six. Um, we'll be having, oh, sorry, the seventh group is on cluster coordination. Very good. Um, and actually, the, the whole point that you were just bringing up, Omar, about what um, should not be subcontracted, you know, project development, that, that, that shifts right back over to the cluster coordinators. So if you're a cluster coordinator, please join that group, delve with those questions. And then the last group is really on protection, and we haven't touched on it as much, but protection is a huge aspect of the localization discussion and um i i think that it's it's um very 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 difficult to be talking about cccm if we're not actually bringing in kind of the protection component so we will convene reconvene it is 3 12 right now so that means that you have exactly five minutes for a break. And so that is a very quick stretch and come back. Those of you that are still here, that aren't going anywhere, let's, um, let's have a cup of coffee together, so. Thanks, Jen, see you all in five. Don't be late. Jen, do you want me to open the breakout rooms or? Yes, please. Can you open the breakout rooms and I'm gonna put on screen the and i'm going to pause recording now also i'm sorry i'm i'm off on my timing time and the opportunity to apply what's been done um and at global level what we could do is is create visibility bring local actors to 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 those um international platforms to ensure that when we talk about capacity, uh, capacity building talk about sure they are involved and they can share their know-how. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn next to Spanish. Nicolas. Hey, thanks, Jennifer. Well, I think the, the discussion goes more or less in the same way that in French. Um, the lack of funds to continue the capacity building activities is one of the main uh, gaps that the people have. Usually they have funds to do uh, training or any kind of activity, but there is no uh, continuity on that and uh, there is a need of a linkage more with the local context and with the local NGOs to continue the localization and also the link with governments and try to start using their language and not try to put all language on their on their structures and uh, I would say that yeah it's more or less that but to keep it short. Thanks Nicholas. Um, Elena in English Hi. So we had uh, different inputs, I would say, in terms of what capacity building can do for localization. Uh, we kind of agree that we need a very comprehensive uh, capacity building approach uh, that we often tend to uh, focus on the uh, technical aspect and fail to understand that we need to also support local partners in fundraising, uh, become HRP partners, competing uh, uh, for, uh, for the common humanitarian funds, but also with, uh, with other international and national donors. Um, so really give a 360 degree approach to capacity building. Uh, and what uh, and also be ready to you know to to absorb uh, uh, knowledge from from the local actors because uh, they can help us getting access and they can help us building a very uh, deeper uh, understanding of uh, the social and cultural context we operate so we need to be capacitated as well and we be open to be capacitated as well. 
um, and uh, what can the global level do? Uh, so big obstacle were identified in lack of trainers and lack of contextualizing training materials. So definitely for more trainers, local trainers that can train in local language and can uh, keep their training knowledge within the operation uh, and also support uh, contextualization of sharing uh, of training material and sharing of, uh, of, uh, of training materials among uh, among uh, three CMers. Triple CMers. Triple CMers. I think next time we let Anjar give his uh, three year course from from CRS to all of us. Um, uh, Amina, uh, you looked at protection, which was slightly different, but but tell us about um, the lens of protection in the discussion that you had. Okay, so unfortunately, a too short discussion. Uh, so, uh, but still, we we managed to to have some key um, key elements and maybe some key uh, suggestions or recommendations also from the participants. We were a small group, uh, so we are lucky to have a pretty pretty open conversation. So, um, on some of the key uh, key points that were highlighted, I mean, first of all, uh, we discussed about the need to have the same language, and to also talk about harmonization of procedures as well and also trying to have like standards uh, that are actually critical and being critical to actually having a better coordinated and a better like uh, a better response at all. So that was one of the key points that was highlighted. And also most of the participants also uh, highlighted the critical role of participation and community participation as well. So because uh, when it comes to like protection as well, uh, so it's Acknowledging also that the first responders are the authorities and are also the local organizations, uh, it's also really critical to ensure that participation is being done not only during a response, but also ahead of a response to like lead towards like more preparedness also efforts and leading to a more coherent response as well. So uh, we are lucky also to have one person from like the authorities that were there that highlighted the role of like institutionalization and policies as well, being critical into in building like a stronger response in the long term and also that will enhance the predictability of some of the answers when it comes to protection. And lastly, I mean, uh, around all of that, uh, what is really critical is around capacity building, of course, because from most of the things that will be done, capacity building remains critical to, uh, to ensure that all of the actors that are on, on the ground at a local level are being capacitated actually with enough resources and skills to be able to support a better answer to like protection challenges that arise with displacement crisis. Over. Thank you. you. You've taken us full circle back through um, each of the breakout groups. And it, I just really want to say um, uh, the most sincere thank you to the panelists who are experts in this topic. So um, Director Rivero, you, you gave us the words. You said, keep going, you know, engage, institutionalize, prepare. And those three actions, if we could break them down to be able to carry it into each of the complex emergencies, into the multiple natural disasters, and into the relationships between cluster coordinators and um, operational actors, you would really um, have a much better response. So we thank you for your leadership and participating today. And we wish you all the best in the response to the, the current typhoon. Um, Nemo and um, I, I really uh, appreciate you giving us kind of a, a better idea about what those challenges are and, and inspiring us for the ways in which we can try to, to, make, to be that bridge and to, to work on those power dynamics because the power dynamics are always gonna be there but unless we learn from them, then we're never gonna be able to get out of this, um, this cycle. And um, I think, that highlights what precisely what Yaxan and and Andra were saying is that you know we're going to be here and this is our country and these these are the responses that is what we want to build in that so Yaxan, Andra, thank you so much. Um, I, I wish next time that we can be all together to talk about localization again and I think that we've all learned so much from this and I just wish the conversation could go on. I don't know Juan if you can extend the Zoom link so that we can have more informal discussion afterwards. But Charlie, I turn it back over to you and thank each and one of the participants and everyone who joined on the platform today.
I think a huge thanks to you, Jennifer, for fantastic facilitation in a complex session with loads going on in there. I just want to add a couple of things before we go, because um, I know that folk have probably got important things they want to get to. So just a couple of points from me. Firstly, to say um, that tomorrow on our path, we're just starting north and we're going to go to participation, accountability and inclusion with Mario Rodland. And I think you can see mini Mario if you look at her uh, Zoom picture at the moment. Many, maybe mini Mario is going to, there she is, going to uh, help us with the facilitation tomorrow and Giovanna Federici. So that will be a really good session. The other thing I wanted to mention is as part of that opportunity to carry on discussions, we're setting up some networking groups. So one of the great things about a face-to-face -face event like this is you get a chance to just sit and have coffee with people. And we know we can't do this here, much as I tried with my coffee cup in my kitchen this morning, but we're gonna set up these three sessions. So note these down in your diary, all times at Geneva. We're just simply gonna create some breakout rooms and give you the opportunity to meet new people, chat with them, find out what they're doing and how they're doing it. Um, and, and just a chance to meet people for future, for future engagement and future networking. And then finally, just as I like to do at the end of each day, I would like just if you have a moment and you have a view, feel free to share your views. Again, it's a mentee, so just grab the phone and go to 58, 70, 76 and 9. Remember in your phone, don't put in mentimeter.com. Just go to uh, any internet browser and type in menti.com and answer these two questions. So one is, what did you like about today? And the other is, what would make tomorrow better? Because we always want to make tomorrow better. Once you've done those, just again, from adding to what Jen said, thank you so much. I feel like today's been a really engaging session. I think that's thanks to everyone who's, who's taken part in it. Um, we really appreciate you being here and we hope to see many, if not all of you and all your friends and family tomorrow uh, in the session then. So thanks very much and bye for now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, bye. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Thank you, bye. Bye. Thank you, bye. Thank you, keep safe, keep healthy. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Salah. Thank you.